Shalom Havarim. Welcome, friends in Hebrew. My name is Tony Pino, and today we're going to continue in our series concerning the book of Revelation. Today, we're going to begin in chapter 14. But before we begin, let's start out with the blessing of salvation. Let's give all praise and glory and honor to Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah, our Lord, our King, for he's the only way to the Father, and he is the giver of eternal life. So if you know this blessing, go ahead and join in with me. Baruch Atah Yahweh Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam. Asher Tana Noet Derech HaYeshua, Mashiach, Yeshua Baruch Hu. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has made the way of salvation through the Messiah, Yeshua. Blessed be his name. Amen. Amen. So welcome back, everyone, to our series today. We are heading into chapter 14. And just a reminder, the chapters and verses are not divinely inspired. When Yohanan was given this letter uh, by the Father to be written down, it was written down as one long scroll or one long book, uh, more than likely. No chapters and verses, no breaks, no headings in any of that, okay? And so this is a continual thought that is occurring here. Moving in from chapter 13 to 14, we just talked about the mark of the beast, all right? And I don't really oftentimes spend a whole lot of time on the mark of the beast, which um, is connected to 666 or 616. There is one manuscript that has 616, but most scholars are in agreement that it is 666. Uh, they look at various languages and various um, alphabets and numbers pertaining to the Greek or the Hebrew or the Aramaic. You know, it doesn't even really tell us which language to look at for that number. Um, I am not convinced that that is, there's a whole lot of purpose in looking for that number in that sense, because you're going to have to know which language to look at it in, right? And so we have it written here in Greek, but, you know, it could be Hebrew, it could be Aramaic. It's just not told to us, right? People will say, well, we have it in Greek, so that's what the father wanted us to look at. So we should look at the letters in Greek and the numbers and then try to find out who the anti-Mashiach is, his name will reflect that. Okay, but I prefer just to wait. And when the anti-Mashiach, as we are told by scripture, takes over Jerusalem, okay, and stops the daily offering system, at that point, he will instill the mark. He will instill what it is, and we will know it then. And I heavily lean more towards the mark. 666 is leaning towards man, okay, the man who is the anti-Mashiach, we will know that connection when he arises. So I'm looking, I'll be looking at him. It'll, it'll definitely be connected to that. And then we'll see, is it the actual name of the anti-Mashiach? You know, is it something else? Is it just because he is a man and not a follower of Yahweh? Okay, 777 is the number of perfection. The Ruach HaKodesh living inside of you is perfecting you, sealing you. You are connected to Yahweh, you are his. And so um, there could be a better connection with 777 with that. You are sealed by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, but 666 is the number of a man. It's someone who uh, might not be connected to Yeshua, just, hey, it's man, okay, doing his own thing, doing what is right in his own eyes. There's a lot of things we could discuss and speculate um, on that, but I think it's pretty interesting here. We're going to see that the 144,000 are connected to the father's name. So, uh, you know, being connected to the father's name and not connected to the, what, the anti-Mashiach, there's a big difference there, okay? Um, let's see, let's go ahead and get into chapter 14 of the book of Revelation, amen? All right, so here we are in chapter 14, book of Revelation, starting with verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, right? Mount Zion, the area of Jerusalem. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's not going to be, um, you know, a particular mountain. He's going to be in that area, okay? We're not looking for a particular mountain, but that entire area, he will be standing in there. Now, some people say it'll be the Temple Mount. And some people say, well, the true temple is down in the city of David. So they might speculate that he might be down there. You know, we'll just have to wait and see. 
but he will be standing on Mount Zion and with him were the 144,000, okay? Who had his name and his father's name written on their forehead. Now, speculation for me is that is the tetratrometer, okay? The four letters, yud hey wow hey or yud hey vav hey. All right, there's two ways people try and say it. And this is not only the father's name, but it is Yeshua's name also because he is Yahweh. He is of the same essence and nature as the father, though distinct and separate. So they do share the divine name, okay? And just because the father is greater than the son, that is in position, not essence, not nature, okay? They are both uncreated and eternal, but they are in different positions. Now, they have the name of the son, Yeshua, okay, because it's the lamb and the father written on their foreheads. Let's go ahead and go back to Revelation chapter 7 for a second, and I want to show you something here. All right, so in Revelation chapter 7, it says, after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He cried out with a loud voice to the four angels who were permitted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our Elohim, our God. So this seal, in my opinion, is the name of the Father, okay? And so it is a sealing of type. Now, whether this is metaphorical or real, will we actually see the four letters written on their forehead? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, the word seal here in the Greek uh, can be used metaphorically, and it can be used... Um, you know, in reality, it's like a signet ring, you know, putting a signet ring into a, um, like a melted wax so that it leaves that imprint of that seal, that signet ring that was often used in this time. So this is something you need to think about because this is first century. And this is what would have gone through the minds of a first century person is some type of visible seal. Okay. That would have represented Elohim. Well, his name is what represents him. It glorifies him and it points to his character. And these here will be walking in his image. They will be bearing the character of the father and the son, the, the, uh, the, and the Ruach HaKodesh also. So they have the seal of the, of, on their foreheads of the servants of God. So some will say, oh, this is, you know, I've seen pictures, oh, it's 777. Because 777 is the number of perfection, all right? And then we have 666 for, you know, of course, the anti-Mashiach. It's the number of a man. So whether we see the mark as something uh, real or spiritual, that's something we're going to have to wait and see as far as the 666. Um, I think it's something real. I lean towards that because you can't buy or sell with it. So there's some type of allegiance or dedication that's going to be uh, very evident to everyone that you are making when you are living in the anti mashiachs empire and have dedicated your life to him, to uh, worship him. And worship him also just can mean dedicated to, dedicated to uh, following him. Okay, it's not necessarily have to mean bow down and worship. It can mean that, but not necessarily. And so we will not be dedicated to that system or follow after that system. Again, I don't think that the anti mashiachs kingdom will be worldwide, okay, globally in that sense. It'll be in a particular area. So if you live in that area, yes, that mark will be um, there. You can't buy or sell without it. And then here we have the 144,000. They have the seal, okay, or the mark or the seal on their foreheads. And I think that Revelation chapter 14 is telling us what that seal is. It's the name of the Lamb and the Father, okay? which is, for me, Yahweh. It is yud heh wow heh or yud heh vav heh. Okay. 
All right, let's go ahead and get back to Revelation 14. All right, in verse two here, Revelation 14, and I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and the booming of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like harpists playing on their harps and they sing, a, I'm sorry, and they are singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders and no one is able to learn the song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. All right, so from my perspective, verse two, the uh, sound that I heard was a voice from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and booming of a loud thunder. I connect that to the voice um, of Yeshua, right? Or the voice of the Father. It can be connected to the Father there because Yeshua is down here on the earth, but it is a booming voice. Now, some people will say it's the Father, Yeshua. Some people say it's one of the angels up there. Um, it is kind of hard to tell, but when we look in Revelation chapter one, Revelation chapter one, let's go ahead and go there. All right, so here in Revelation chapter one, starting with verse 13, it says, in the midst of the menorot, I saw one like a son of man, okay? I believe this is Yeshua, clothed in a robe down to his feet with a golden belt wrapped around his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, white like snow and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of a rushing waters. So this is connected also to Revelation chapter 14, where he heard a sound like the sound of rushing waters and like thunder, and the voice was like a harp, uh, harpist playing, you know, a harp. And so this is just... Um, Probably, I mean, it's like, been thinking on this for a while, it's it's the voice of Yeshua, it's the voice of the Father, it's the voice of the Ruach HaKodesh, it's his glory, it's, it's kind of transcending in a sense, um, but it's representing the Father, Son, and the Ruach HaKodesh, it's representing the glory um, that comes forth from the throne here, because we also have this connection to the book of Ezekiel. So let's go ahead and go to Ezekiel chapter, I believe it's chapter one. All right, so here we are in Ezekiel chapter one, and we have the beings that are within the wheels here uh, in this picture. And starting with verse 20, it says, wherever the Ruach, the spirit wanted to go, they went in the direction the Ruach wanted to go. The wheels rose along with them. The spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Whenever the creatures went, the wheels went. When the creatures stood still, these wheels stood still. When the creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose with them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Now, over the heads of the living creatures, there was something like an expanse, shining like the color of ice stretched forth over their heads. Under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, one toward the other. Each had another pair covering its body. When they moved, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of rushing waters, like the voice of Shaddai, okay? Yahweh Most High, the Most High. A noise of uh, tumult, like the noise of an army. Whenever they stood still, they let their wings, let down their wings. There came a voice from above the expanse over their heads. Whenever they stood still, they let their, down their wings. Above the expanse over their heads was something like a throne resembling a sapphire stone. Above the shape of the throne was a figure of a man, a human appearance. I believe this is Yeshua here. So this sound of the rushing waters um, is representing, I believe, Yeshua, the glory of Yeshua the glory of the Father, it's the glory coming probably from the throne area is what I am uh, gathering here because these beings are going wherever the Ruach, the Spirit, leads them to go, all right? And so now we're going to go to another section in Ezekiel. So in Ezekiel chapter 43, verses one through five, it says, then he led me to the gate, the gate looking east, 
All right, so this is during the time of the millennial reign. Remember, Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48 is the return of Yeshua. It is the millennial reign temple that will be here during that time when Yeshua is on the earth. And so uh, it says, then he led me to the gate, the gate looking east, and behold, the glory of Elohim of Israel was coming from the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters. The earth was radiant with his glory. The appearance of the vision that I saw was like the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. The visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Kherba. So I fell on my face. Then the glory of Yahweh came into the house by way of the great faith, um, sorry, the gate facing the east. The Ruach took me up and brought me into the inner court. Then behold, the glory of Yahweh filled the house. All right. So this sound is like the sound of many waters, rushing waters. It's being connected also, I think, to the glory of Yahweh. So it's all interconnected, the glory of Yahweh, Yeshua, the Father, the Ruach HaKodesh, this sound here. Um, he's just describing what it could be, okay, what it is connected to. It's like the sound of rushing waters, okay? It's like the boom of a thunder. It's like um, a harp is playing on a harp, giving connection, I believe, to the glory of Yahweh, the glory of Yeshua, the glory of the Father, and the Ruach HaKodesh. Amen. All right, so let's go ahead and get back to Revelation 14. Now in here, Revelation 14, in verse 3, they're singing a new song, one that they haven't sung before, and nobody can know this song or sing it, okay, except those who are of the 144,000. So it says in verse 3, and they are singing a new song before the throne, and before the living or living creatures and the elders, and no one is able to learn the song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. So in chapter 14, what I believe I am seeing here is the last part of the seven years. This is the end of the tribulation period. The 144,000 have been raptured and redeemed. It's not giving you the exact timing of them, but if I were to guess, all right, this is the time of the rapture. Uh, at the very end, when Yeshua comes back, okay, and he goes over to Mount Zion, right, whether the dead in uh, Yeshua will rise right away when he comes back or after he goes and does what he needs to do in uh, Mitzrayim and Egypt, and then he goes to Sinai, then he comes up through Basra, and he comes into the city of Jerusalem over here by Mount Zion, Somewhere in there, the rapture is going to occur, either in the beginning or maybe right at the end when he is descending down here on Mount Zion, because we're going to have that connection to Zechariah chapter 14. Uh, this redeeming from the earth, the 144,000 could be with him all throughout the time when he first uh, comes through. But, and what's, what's he, what is he doing? He's redeeming them from the earth, meaning if they are raptured, then they have become changed, okay? While they are here on the earth, they are in human form. They are mortal, right? Being redeemed from the earth, it just basically means you've changed from mortal to immortality, all right? Doesn't mean that you have to physically die like people do today where they live out their old age and then they die, go to the dust of the earth in, the, in that sense, or they get killed in some fashion or form. And then they go and we're all waiting to be, you know, uh, resurrected and redeemed. Uh, but those who are standing here alive, when Yeshua comes, we will meet him in the air. We will be caught up in the air. We will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, says Paul, Shaul. All right. And that twinkling of an eye, that change, that moving from mortal to immortality, that is going through a death. Okay. Shedding this body that is mortal. Right? You don't have to physically die in the same sense we all think of. You could just be changed, meet Yeshua up in the air, and that could very possibly be happening to the 144,000 because I don't see them dying anywhere. Nowhere in Scripture have they been put to death. Okay, They have the seal of Yahweh on their forehead. They are protected all right, from the uh, kingdom of darkness, and so this, to me, could be a type of rapture. Now, it says in verse four, these are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. 
Now, I don't believe that this means that they have never been married. Okay, when you study the Torah, you know that um, within Judaism, within those days, they did not have relations with their wives before they went off to battle. Okay, because the wars that they fought were considered holy wars. Okay, because they are fighting in the name of Yahweh. All right, they represent Yahweh on the earth. They are the light to all nations. So when they go out to battle, of course, they are bringing the Ark of the Covenant in front of them. They are representing his name. It is a holy war. Yahweh is calling them to go to war, go to fight, to defeat their enemies. And so it is considered a holy war. So when you go out to fight a holy war, you need to be ritually cleansed, ritually clean. Okay. And so in the Torah, when a man and women have relations, all right, the uh, man and woman are unclean until the next evening. So if that night they have relations, okay, they are not going to be ritually clean because they're going to have to go out and take a mikvah. They're going to have to go out and wash sometime after, um, after the uh, relations is finished. They will have to go out and wash, and then they are unclean until the following evening, says that in the Torah. Let's go ahead and go to Deuteronomy chapter 23, chapter 23. All right, so here we are in Deuteronomy, Davarim, chapter 23, verses 10 through 11. It says, when you go out as an army camp against your enemies, you are to guard yourself from everything evil. Okay, this would include being ritually unclean. If there is among you a man who is not clean from a nighttime emission, all right, having relations with his wife, he is to go outside the camp. He may not re-enter the camp. Let's go ahead. I got to put this up a little bit more here. Give us a few more verses. So he shall not go outside the camp. Um, it says, verse 12, now toward evening, he is to bathe in water, and when the sun sets, he may re-enter the camp. There is to be a place at hand for you outside the camp, and you are to go there outside. You are to have a shovel for yourself among your weapons. Now, when you sit down outside, you are to dig with it and turn and cover up what comes out of you. All right, so this emission, all right, doesn't just, it covers a vast um, number of things that could be happening, okay? If you have some type of disease or some type of infection or anything of that nature, but it also includes uh, having relations with your wife. You are unclean. The next day you go and you wait till it's close to evening time and you would wash yourself. You would be uh, able to come into the camp at that time, all right? Now, this is all connected to the temple, okay? Some people will ask, well, why aren't you guys doing that today? You say the law of Moshe is, um, you know, still upon us and everything. What this has to do is ritually uncleanness inside the camp because you are connected to the temple area. There is no temple right now. There is no Mishkan moving tabernacle right now where you go and worship because it's all connected to that, that ritual purity you need to be connected to the temple because that's where you would go to worship and pray um, and do your offerings. So that is why ritual impurity, as far as the law of Moshe right now, is suspended. All right. If you plan on being in the land of Israel and going to the Temple Mount or whatever, you will have to be ritually clean even when Yeshua returns. Now, spiritually speaking, because of the blood of Yeshua, you are clean. Okay. Spiritually speaking. He has cleansed you from all unrighteousness. And so that is the power of the blood. It is greater. Amen. But this here, of course, is happening before Yeshua. And this is what's being connected also to in Revelation chapter 14 with the 144,000. It's all connected to the law of Moshe. If you don't understand the law of Moshe, you don't understand what's going on in the book of Revelation. That's just very key. Otherwise, people make up all kinds of things. Now, if we go to Leviticus 15, we can see if any man has an emission of semen 
then he is to bathe his whole body in water and be unclean until the evening. Every garment and all leather with semen on it are to be washed with water and will be unclean until evening. If a man lies with a woman and there is an emission of semen, they should both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until evening. Okay. Not only is this good hygiene, but it was a ritual cleansing also. So the idea of these men not defiling themselves with women, okay, they are virgins, just simply is an idiomatic form of them being ritually clean. We can see this also talking about King David. King David is running from King Saul. He has his men with him. And in 1 Samuel 21, verses 5 through 6, the Kohen answered David, David, saying, there is no common bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread. This is the show bread there in the tabernacle area. So long as the young man have kept themselves from women, right? These are not virgins. These are not unmarried men. They've kept themselves from relations with women. They are ritually clean, okay? Of course, women have been kept from us as on previous campaigns, David answered the Kohen. So the young men's vessels were holy though it was an ordinary mission, how much more so will their vessels be holy today? Okay, They are running from Saul. They are protecting King David. And so they are on a holy mission. Now, if we go to 2 Samuel chapter 11, okay, this is when Uzziah comes back. I'm sorry, Uriah, not Uzziah. Uriah comes back, and this is Bathsheba's husband. Okay, he comes back to spend time with King David, and it says here in verse 9, but Uriah slept at the door of the royal place with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. So King David kind of was trying to encourage him. Of course, he already had relations with Bathsheba, and she was pregnant, so he was trying to get the husband to go down and have relations. That might solve the problem. He'll think that that's his kid and you know problem solved so to speak but what does uriah do when they informed david saying uriah did not go down to his house david said to uriah haven't you come from a journey why didn't you go down to your house but uriah answered david the ark and israel and yehuda judah are staying in tents and my lord yoab and the officers of my Lord are camping in the open field. Should I then go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Okay, He's keeping himself from that. And it's in honor of his fellow countrymen who are at war fighting to defend Israel. So there is this tradition, there is this um, cultural aspect that you keep yourself ritually clean going to war while you're at war. Uh, it's a holy war. There's a lot of ways um, that we can explain this. Okay. Now, this is just speaking culturally of what it was like back then. The Torah uh, it just is commanding if you have relations with your wife, that you are going to be unclean until the following evening. Both of you would need to do a ritual washing. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and go back to Revelation 14. So Revelation 14 says these are the ones, starting with verse 4, who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. Okay, see how that's similar to uh, following the spirit, wherever the Ruach was led in Ezekiel chapter 1, those spiritual beings went. Okay. These have been redeemed from among mankind as first fruits for Elohim and the Lamb. Okay, this type of redemption, could it be because this is the resurrection? They are the first fruits, connected to the first fruits of the resurrection uh, part. When Yeshua comes back the second time, this is the first fruits of that. They are being redeemed from the earth. They have been changed. They've gone from mortal to immortality because we do have uh, in Jeremiah, that Israel is a type of first fruits unto Yahweh um, from all the earth. We can go to Jeremiah chapter 2. 
All right, so in Jeremiah chapter 2, starting with verse 1, it says, Again, the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Yahweh, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, and the way you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. All right, let's go on to verse 3. Verse 3 says, Israel was kadosh, was holy to Yahweh the first fruits of the harvest. All who devoured him were held guilty. Catastrophic overtook him or took them. It is a declaration of Yahweh. Okay. Israel is a type of first fruits. This 144,000 is a type of first fruits unto Yahweh. Now, someone brought up a good point. Uh, when we were studying this the other day, and that is the 144,000 might not be the exact number, might be a roundabout number. All right, so in Revelation 14, this number 144,000, and we see it in Revelation 7, where it talks about the 12 tribes of Israel, 144,000. I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see because a lot of times the numbers that are given here in the Bible, oftentimes scholars say, well, that's just a roundabout number that they're not trying to be exact, but they're giving you a, um, you know, just a time frame or not a time frame, but a number frame of a roundabout, so to speak. Okay. Uh, could be, that could be possible. We have to, you know, leave that open. We'll see when it happens, if it'll be exact or not. All right, so it says also that in their mouth was found no lie. They are blameless. Okay, so the preaching that they are doing, the speaking that they are doing, all right, is blameless. They're not going to lie. They're never going to lie. So whatever they're going to be telling people about Yeshua, about the Father, they're going to be prophesying. They're going to be uh, redeeming, helping to bring people in the kingdom, so helping the uh, the power of the Ruach HaKodesh to flow in people's lives and redeeming them, they are going to be blameless. Well, what do you, what determines what is blameless? It's the law of Moshe. Okay. The law of Moshe. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that when Yeshua comes, when the Messiah comes, he will destroy the law of Moshe. It'll never be anymore. He will do a work and it'll all be gone. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Tanakh that I have read maybe i've missed something maybe someone can send me a verse or something where it says that the messiah will destroy the torah that he will abolish it that it will be no more um and so we'll have to wait and see okay but i don't believe that there's anywhere there that it says that the law of moshe will end because what really is the law of moshe it is the law of yahweh Okay. Now it does say there will be no more death, right? So the animal offering system will die out. Okay. That will cease when it says there's no more death. Okay. Now I can see no more um, animal offerings, right? Now, will that then take care of ritual uncleanness? Will there be no more ritually being ritually unclean? I would think so. Okay because there's no, going to be no more uncleanness in the kingdom of Yahweh. But when does all this occur? The only time you're going to see these things occur is after the white throne judgment. That's when there is no more death. That's when he wipes all tears from our eyes. The millennial reign, we see death going on. We still see people coming into the kingdom in the millennial reign time. Okay. There still will be animal offerings. Just read Jeremiah, Yermeyahu, chapter 33, verses 14 through 26. That's one of the best places to go to, to show that there still will be death and offerings going on. So the law of Moshe is still being followed here. We're not in the millennial reign here in chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. So the law of Moshe is still what determines what is blameless. What does that mean? word blameless mean? How do we determine someone is blameless? Well, some in, within Western Christianity is, well, you become blameless because of the righteousness of Yeshua. And that is absolutely true. Through his righteousness, we become blameless. His work on the cross, right? We become blameless. Now, 
Does that mean we are able to go off and sin? Does that give us permission to sin? No, Paul says it doesn't give us permission to sin. Well, what determines what sin is? The law of Moshe. The law of Moshe tells us what sin is. So blameless is what? Every time we put the blood of Yeshua on our sins, we become blameless. Today, every day, when you ask for forgiveness and you confess your sins to Yeshua, you become blameless. When you sin, okay, there is a defilement that comes upon you. Now, does all sin uh, equal the same? No, it doesn't. There were sins in the law of Moshe that were called unintentional sins, okay? And that's just a category, so be careful. It's not just sins of ignorance, all right? But it was a category because there were some sins that when you study the law of Moshe, you purposely did, but it didn't call for a capital punishment, okay? It didn't call for you to be immediately removed from the community. You could do an offering and become cleansed again. So just because we sin today doesn't mean you're automatically just removed from the kingdom or whatnot, all right? High-handed sins, I believe, would remove you from the kingdom because that took time for you to actually do it, all right? That was a conscious of the will. If you um, commit murder, commit idolatry, commit um, sexual immorality, adultery, all of those things, there's a lot of steps that you had to take leading up to that, that you were being defiled, okay? You were being defiled in your heart. You weren't checking that. You were doing some other acts, uh, most likely, that were leading up to it. And then you actually did the what is called a high-handed sin uh, within the traditions of Israel in the first century. A high-handed sin is when you do something that the Torah says, all right, now you got to be excommunicated. Now you got to be removed from the kingdom. Well, today with the blood of Yeshua, okay, you do have an opportunity to repent because that blood, in my opinion, it covers all sins, all right? It covers the sin of murder. It covers the sin of idolatry. It covers the sin of sexual immorality. So a person does not have to, have to be immediately removed. They can repent and turn and come back. But um, when we are talking about what determines what is blameless, what is a lie and not a lie, you know, who is holy and who is not holy, that's all determined by the law of Moshe. There's nowhere in scripture where that changes. And again, the law of Moshe is the law of Yahweh. It's his law, right? It's holy, righteous, and good. It's something that we should uh, enjoy, okay? King David enjoyed and thanked Yahweh for his laws, for his precepts, for his judgments, because you would not know right or wrong without it. So when someone is trying to say that the law of Moshe has been nailed to the cross or done away with, now you are messing with Yahweh's word, okay? And you are going to get very confused on right and wrong. You are going to be ending up making your decision on what seems right in your own eyes, okay? But Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 19, not one jot or tittle of the law will fall away until all is fulfilled. And that included the words of the prophets also. And we can show you passages in the Torah that have not been fulfilled yet by Yeshua. He'll be coming back a second time to fulfill those things. The covenant of Abraham has not been fully fulfilled yet. Israel is not living in the land like they should be and operating the way they should be. And that's been prophesied that that will happen in the end times in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 11. So we do not have all of the Torah fulfilled by Yeshua yet. It's in the process of being fulfilled. And we have many words in the prophets where Yeshua needs to come back and fulfill those passages, okay, before the animal offerings can end, before death can end, okay? All things have to be redeemed back to Yeshua. And the fact that we are standing here still mortal and others are still mortal tells you everything has not been completed yet, okay? All right, so we're going to go ahead and stop here with part one of Revelation chapter 14. Next time together, we will get into these three angels and we will finish up the chapter together. Amen. So I hope you are enjoying our series here today. Um, let's go ahead and end with Psalm 67. Psalm 67 today. Amen. In Psalm Tehillah, 
okay, in Hebrew, 67, the title, I love the title here, let all the peoples praise you, speaking to Yahweh, amen. For the music director with strings, instruments, a psalm, a song. May Elohim be gracious to us and bless us. May he cause his face to shine upon us so that your way may be known on earth and your salvation known, I'm sorry, and your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O Elohim. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you will judge the peoples fairly and guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O Elohim. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its harvest. Elohim, our Elohim, will bless us. Elohim will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Amen. So until we meet again, everyone, shalom.